Thank you for joining us, and welcome to the Situating Science Podcast. I'm Izzy Marin, cluster student at the Situating Science Strategic Knowledge Cluster. This is the next installment in a series of podcasts complementing the ongoing Lives of Evidence National Lecture Series. The lecture series will be looking at the lives and death of evidence. Because the death of evidence is on everyone's lips, key questions are being raised in various realms of research. Some of the questions raised by the speakers will explore how evidence is produced, how trust in evidence and research can be maintained or destroyed, the relationship between research, funding, and policy, and whether or not transparency has a place in research. The lecture series will highlight the urgency of these matters and what we can do to prolong and enhance the lives of evidence. Today we're chatting with Dr. Scott Finley, co-founder of Evidence for Democracy and associate professor of biology at the University of Ottawa. The talk he will be giving, titled Governing in the Dark, Evidence, Accountability, and the Future of Canadian Science, will be part of the discussions surrounding the role of the government in the shift in Canadian science away from basic research towards business-oriented research. Dr. Finley will be exploring the phenomenon as symptomatic of a larger problem, that is, a deterioration of informed democratic principles. So, Dr. Finley, could you get into some of the details of business-oriented research and its backing from the federal government? Uh, Which sectors are getting special treatment and which are getting cut off at the knees? I think that there are, in terms of what's getting cut off at the knees, I think it would be public interest science generally construed. So we have a bunch of science that's done in government and also in, to a lesser extent, in academe, which is concerned with informing Canadians about the health of our bodies, the health of our environment, the health of the air and water, the health of our economies. And I would say that those are the kinds of science, that's the kind of science where we're seeing a reduced investment on the part of the federal government in, in those areas of science. By contrast, there seems to be increasing investment or increasing interest in science that is sort of at the end of the research and development pipeline. And this is science that is concerned with industrialization or commercialization of, of technologies, for example. So the government is, has been, especially over the last few years, increasingly interested in investing in, in programs that are designed to facilitate that sort of science. And I should say that there's nothing intrinsically wrong about that. Uh, In part, its motivation for doing so is that by some of the the performance metrics that are used by OECD, Canada has, for the last few years, kind of lagged behind in what's called bird business uh, investment in research and development. And so a number of these programs have been designed to try and encourage business to get involved in, in the scientific enterprise, research and development. So the problem is not that, you know, the government is investing in these things, but you you have to balance the investment that you put into science that's happening at the end of the the R&D processes versus science that's happening at the wellspring. Because we have to remember that even though the the path is very torturous and there's a bunch of different pathways and backtracking in science, you start off, the wellspring is fundamental discovery-based research. And what comes out, there's different pipe pipelines, but it's the, only at the end that you get commercializable technologies. And you can't have that unless you have the original wellspring of ideas. So it's important to try and get the balance right. What do we as Canadian citizens stand to lose if business continues as usual in terms of federal funding trends and uh, maybe a lack of attention towards the wellsprings that you mentioned? There's a couple of things. Basic research, as I've already said, basic research is, is the wellspring from which applied and commercialization research depends. Mm-hmm. But the other thing is, and, and I guess you can relate more to this, is that um, the, I guess the most valuable natural resource that we have is not you know, fish or oil or timber. It's actually creativity and imagination. And the natural world is is the natural focus of the inquiring mind. And so really basic research is, is designed to stimulate creativity and imagination and kind of temper it in, in the crucible of the scientific method. And to me, that's the real value of basic research is 
is it what's developed, it aligns creativity and imagination, it fosters creativity and imagination, and, but it does so in a way that's kind of made more rigorous by the scientific method. And that to me is the most important contribution that the, ba the basic research enterprise makes. And I'm, by the way, I'm beyond that stage now. This is for the next generation of scientists that are coming. Unfortunately, I'm past my prime. Do you think that there are any remedies to the deterioration of democratic principles? And could you actually get into some of the details of the democratic principles that are uh, being affected by the change in balance between business-oriented research and basic research? I don't think, you know, I don't want to strictly dichotomize this as kind of business-oriented research on the one hand and basic research on the other. It's more, it, it's more research in the public interest. Okay. And, and so I, I think that there's a number of issues here that are relevant to, to inter, public interest science. The first one is, and this is, you know, governance 101, Jefferson made the point in 1776 that democracy depends on an informed public. And if you don't have an informed public or you don't make an effort to inform the public, basically what you do is breed credulity. And, and that way, madness lies. So if you want to have a truly democratic system, you need to make sure that the public is well informed. And where does that information come from? A lot of it comes from science. And what is the information that the public most needs to make informed decision? The information that's coming from public interest science about issues relating to our health, the health of our bodies, the health of our minds, the health of our environment, the health of our, our economies. And I and others are concerned by the erosion of the, the ability to first of all, on the one hand, collect that information because of cuts to government science, and secondly, to disseminate that information to the public because of what I and many other people consider to be pretty constraining communication policies on the part of the federal government. So if you don't have evidence being collected, or if it is collected and it's not put out there in the public space in an unfiltered form, then there's absolutely no way the public can be well informed. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you buy Jefferson's argument, which I absolutely do, uh, if you don't have an informed in pub public, then you don't have a true democracy. So do you think that this gap between research and public, public and uh, governance have an impact on Canada's place in the global political economy? I think it's fair. It's a fair characterization to say that, in a number of important respects, Canada's reputation on the science file, broadly construed in the international community, is declining, and that's a consequence of of you know perceptions, which I think are an accurate reflection of reality of the decline in federal investment in public interest science and in policies that restrict the communication of scientific information, the access of journalists to scientists. And I think, I think those kinds of things are, and we have all sorts of examples of the international press and even the sci international scientific journals weighing in on, with disapprobation of, about, about the, the current climate for public interest science in Canada. Now, whether that has, you know, downstream economic consequences, whether we have other trading nations that are going to say, you know, we're not going to trade with Canada because, <laughs> because they're, you know, declining investment in public interest science, I mean, I'm not sure I would go that far. But I would say that, that, you know, science is there for a reason. Science is there. We all reap the benefits of science, basic and applied science, and, and you need to have a healthy science, public interest science institution in order to have a healthy democracy. Those two are inextricably linked in my, in my view and in the view of others. Do you think that there are any remedies to the deterioration of the democratic principles that we've been talking about? And who do you think these remedies will need to be undertaken by, if there are any? 
I think ultimately the fate of any public institution depends on the public. So it's, you know, it's one thing for professional scientists to be whining about this stuff, but the, the charge can always be leveled, and it has been leveled at me, you know, right. You're crying about not getting money to do research, or you're crying because you're unemployed, or you're, of course you're whining, of course you're going to say that. So that argument can always be floated, and even though scientists might arguably be in the best position from a scientific perspective to, to make these kinds of arguments, they are, after all, the most informed. Um, that kind of charge reduces their effectiveness. So I, I think that just like everything else in a democracy, that the fate of science, public interest science, rests with the people. People have to become more informed about it. And more than that, they, and this is the thing that for me is most infuriating. It, it really bothers me, this, this retreat or even flight from evidence-informed decision-making. And what, informed, what, what infuriates me even more is the attempt to try and make something that is clearly not informed or well-informed by the evidence to try and represent it as if it is. And we're seeing this a lot. And that, to me, bespeaks a fundamental contempt for the intelligence of the public. Now, I find it hugely patronizing. When, when I hear somebody in the public space giving me an argument that is, you know, it has merely superficial plausibility. It's an angstrom thick. And the minute you drill down below that very, very thin veneer, it all just, it all just vanishes. And... This is done because they can get away with it, because the public is not sufficiently skeptical. And if the public started to become, you know, whether you call it skeptic, skepticism, constructive skepticism, or whether you call it you know, constructive critical analysis, I don't care what you call it, but the public just has to become a bit more skeptical, a bit more critical, because the minute that that happens, then the, the, then the intellectual... The, the, the intellectual level of the debate goes up by a quantum amount like that. Right? You just have to ask. When somebody says, you know what? Uh, we want to reduce crime, drug-related crime, so the way to do that is to introduce, uh, I don't know, minimum mandatory sentences. Yeah, superficially plausible. Yeah, if you provide a bigger disincentive, people won't do it. It's superficially plausible. What's the evidence, right? If that is not, if that hypothesis is not true, then that that huge investment in time and energy in building prisons to accommodate all these people is going to go for naught. You're not going to see any reduction in drug drug related crime. So the very first question somebody should be asking is, where's the evidentiary beef? Well, okay, you're telling us that. Show me the evidence before we invest all this money. And the public, the public has the ability to do this. Every one of us is a scientist. You know, Thomas Henry Huxley said this 150 years ago. There's nothing exalted about the scientific method. It's the normal working of the human mind. So we can all do this stuff very, very easily. We just got out of the habit. So we, we actually have to start doing it. And the minute we start to do, to do that, by we, I don't mean the professional scientists, I mean the public. The minute they start to do that, then, then the nature of the debate, the nature of the discourse will change overnight. Because no longer will, you know, people are going to be on the hook. They're going to have to make the case to a critical public audience. And they're not going to get away with all this, you know, superficial plausibility, which is extremely irritating. Uh, well, thanks so much for chatting with us today, Dr. Finley, and thank you to the listeners for tuning in. For more information on the National Lecture Series and more podcasts, visit situsci.ca. That's S-I-T-U-S-C-I dot C-A.